Hello, welcome to episode 132 of Fear of a Black Planet. I released a book review this week of How to Be an Existentialist by Gary Cox. It's a 10th anniversary edition. It came out in 2009. But it's a great introduction to existentialism and it's a philosophical introduction to existentialism as opposed to say, uh, Sarah Blackwell's At the Existentialist Cafe, which is more of a kind of literary biography. It does have philosophical accounts in that book, but this is a smaller one. Gary Cox's one is a smaller one, and it's um, it's a really good introduction to the ideas. I'm going to read the book review, and then I'll speak a little bit about why I am an existentialist, and it's something that I did a co- an evening course at the end of last year, one of these adult education courses in existentialism because I did philosophy uh, undergraduate and postgraduate and I could never work out why it was such a disappointing process because I discovered philosophy when I was 15 when I'd just been chucked out of my boarding school and I think it was a great way for me to... to I, I started studying philosophy to get my own back against the school in a sense to sort of beat them at their own game because I, the, and this probably uh, is something else I want to talk about, this whole issue of rhetoric today. I have always had an enraged contempt for people who manipulate ideas that are very rich and morally edifying in, in the way that they sound, but in the way that they're deployed are, are abusive. And if you want to understand where my anger comes from, it's not some Freudian explanation. The rage of this podcast comes from the abuse of ideas. And nowhere will you find that more acutely than in an English-style public school boarding school, let me tell you that, where words like community and duty and... School spirit and, um, you know, any of those kind of high minded or even like religious doctrines, um, punctuality and discipline and respect, even freedom, where all these words are deployed as kind of rhetorical weapons against the individual rather than what they actually should be and what they are in the tradition. People going on about the canon man, the tradition man, it's all just a white man's construction man. Well, let me tell you this. I have been right in the belly of the beast of the upper middle class white privilege. Let me tell you that. And I've seen it from the inside and I've raged against it. And I'll tell you the one thing that emancipated me was the tradition. The very tradition that they were using against me. See what I'm saying? So all these high-minded people talking about Latin literature and Shakespeare in that really droning, donish, twatty voice. Somewhere along the line, and it was probably Jim Morrison, actually, of The Doors, where I realised this guy... Is using all the weapons of the establishment, so to speak, against themselves. Because he's smarter and he's cleverer. Just like Nietzsche did. That was a, it's a very Nietzschean tactic. This guy beat them at their own game, Nietzsche. And and Morrison got that from him. It's um Anyway, I've talked about that before in the sense of my definition of what a rebel, a true rebel is is not someone who tries to tear down the tradition or tear down the institutions, but someone more akin to the ancient Jewish prophetic tradition where you call for a resumption of first principles, in a sense. Um, And that anyway, that's the long-winded explanation as to how I got into philosophy, is I realised I could beat them fuckers at at their own game. And, uh, yeah, so, I, um, 
but anyway, my my obviously at that time when when you're in a kind of context like that, and you can sort of you could say, oh well, it's not that bad, is it really? But Christopher Hitchens talked about that. He said that you understand intuitively part of the insidiousness of totalitarianism if you've been to an English public school, and he's right about that. Not that you understand it completely, obviously, and it is a it's a gilded cage, but it's still a cage. And part of that cage is psychological. So I've always been very acutely sensitive to the way that high-minded attitudes can be weaponized surreptitiously. So moralistic language can become even more of a weapon than hateful or abusive language. Do you see what I'm saying? Um... So, anyway, I, I, it became clear to me, even though I, I read, I got into a number of these survey books, which is another thing that, I, I mean, <clears throat> I always say that I hate all this shit about privilege, but we've all had some privileges and advantages that we can recognize other people have not had, and I absolutely will admit this one privilege that I've definitely had and to which I should be eternally grateful and recognize that it's an advantage over other people and that's not a good thing that, I, that, that that's the case it wasn't going to a boarding school and then getting chucked out because then I went to a, 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 a I was at a state school before that I grew up for the first eight years of my life in a in a council house I, so I've seen effectively both sides and then I went to FE College after after being chucked out. And I did some like weird SVQ type qualification. I didn't do the standard. So I've always had that kind of coming at it from that angle. And but one of the things that I did have is that when I when I, I, I my dad was living with his parents at the time. And it would and they had a nice house fucking in the middle of nowhere in Scotland and it was just it, it it was just covered in books so at some point uh, there's a great line in Dylan's memoir where he said you couldn't help when he's talking about a friend's library you couldn't help lose your passion for dumbness <laughs> that's exactly the right phrase it was like after a while, the kind of Bart Simpson, MTV, Kids Club, Burger King culture, Game Boy, Sega culture that I'd grown up in, it just, it just eventually, you, you, you can't, when you're in that environment, and I, and I, and I say this, by the way, I pr please don't misunderstand me here, I was never academic at school, never. I never. I was a despairing case. I had extra maths and extra English. The only books I can ever really remember or loving were Roald Dahl books. Those are the only ones I would read on my own, really. Or maybe the the I remember reading Robert Fulton Scott's Diary. That's about it, really. And all these other kids were fucking super clever at the school, you know, reading Tolkien at the age of ten, literally, all of them, fast. So, <clears throat> eventually though, I realised, partly because I realised Jim Morrison gets lots of girls and he's really intelligent, I'll never be as fucking hot as he is, but I might be, I could make myself smarter, <laughs> that was one reason, definitely, because I started, the way I always got you into reading was reading these rock biographies of Kurt Cobain and, and Jim Morrison, and I read loads of the Jim Morrison books, all, all that I could get my hands on, and I'd already discovered the poetry. So... Eventually, I just started picking up books from the classics and philosophy. And trying to work through them. And I just basically said to myself, I'm not going to understand this shit. But I'm going to keep reading through it until I get smarter. I'm just going to keep reading through it. I'm not going to give up because I can't understand it. And so I basically accepted my dumbness. 
I made peace with my dumbness. And in that moment, I started to enjoy reading when I stopped needing myself to get it all all straight away or to understand it. I started to have a private relationship with, with philosophy and ideas. And luckily enough, my great granny on my dad's side had been one of the first women at St Andrews University to study philosophy. She had actually studied psychology, but it was part of the the Department of Philosophy at the time. And anyway, she had loads of old Edwardian editions of Plato and shit like that, you know. So I, f- I discovered them. Couldn't understand a fucking word of them. But uh, anyway, the upshot is I got into philosophy. And obviously at that age, at that especially in the 90s, which was a very individualistic time, existentialism, you couldn't help but gravitate to Sartre and Camus and uh, all those guys. So I did that and... <clears throat> Yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll read the thing and, I'll, and, and then I'll talk some more about why I, I think it's important and why I think that it's been surpassed existentialism and why it needs to come back. Because, and I speak about this in the, in the, the review, it was trendified to its own detriment. It became a kind of trendy pop culture meme existentialism rather than, and what's great about Gary Cox's book is he demonstrates this, an actually quite rigorous account of the human condition. And so, it, and yeah, anyway, I'll, I talk about it in a bit, but the upshot is it's a metaphysical philosophy. It's not just an ethical, nice idea, right? So anyway, I'll read the book. I'll read the book review and see what you think. Okay, here we go. Philosophy is pointless if it bears no relation to our everyday lives. One of the advantages that existentialism has always had over other philosophical approaches is its sexiness, its willingness to engage with the choices, creative longings and illicit desires that characterise our lives. A downside of all this, however, has been a tendency to oversimplify what existentialism really means, and as a result, it has has been easily dismissed and ignored over the last 30 years. Ten years ago... Gary Cox released How to Be an Existentialist, and the fact that this small book has been republished is a testament to Cox's ability to write with brevity and depth without falling into oversimplification. It is the central strength of this book that it convinces us of the relevance of existentialism while also offering clear and brilliant accounts of the technical and metaphysical foundations of the philosophy. We all know that existentialism is about confronting our mortality, about insisting on our own path in life and affirming human freedom. We all know that it's a view of life that has at its core a commitment to individuality. However, what many readers might not know is that all of these characteristics emerge from a highly rigorous account of human experience in psychology. We learn from Cox that existentialists don't simply think freedom is a pretty neat idea, but that it is a fundamental characteristic of human consciousness. Consciousness, Cox explains, is for the existentialist not a thing in itself, but a relationship. When we are conscious, we are always conscious of something, something or other. Jean-Paul Sartre and his fellow existentialists are not postmodernists or pure idealists that believe the world is nothing but a projection of our minds. However, existentialism recognises that our consciousness plays an active part in forming the comprehensibility of the world. The nothingness of Sartre's famous being and nothingness, therefore, is the awareness of what a thing is not that allows us to understand what a thing is. This awareness of the negativity around the positivity of the object in our perception is the fundamental feature of consciousness. This is all very technical stuff, and Cox has smuggled in genuinely challenging philosophical metaphysics under a book title that seems like nothing more than a self-help gimmick. But the ultimate aim of Cox here is to show that to show us that the freedom at the heart of existentialism is not existentialism is not merely adolescent posturing or countercultural histrionics. It's the hard truth about human reality. Objects only really become objects under the gaze of human subjectivity, and human subjectivity projects all the things that the object is not onto the object, thereby revealing consciousness as a meaning-generating phenomenon. 
consciousness is not fixed. We are always fleeing from a past towards a projected future. The present moment is not really a fixed thing, but in a, per a perennial state of freedom. Human consciousness, then, is by nature temporal. Our lives only really make meaningful sense as experiences of time. This unfixedness of our perennial state of flight from the past towards a projected future is the basis of the existentialist preoccupation with freedom. For Sartre especially, the defining characteristic of what it means to be human is to be free, to be in a perpetual state of having to make choices about the future. Cox has done something very important here. Too often, existentialism is popularised as an ethical theory, a way of grounding values in human freedom. And indeed, that seems to be correct. But existentialism is, existentialism is first and foremost a metaphysical theory, a view of the human condition about how human psychology relates to the world around it. Freedom is the very nature of this relation for existentialists. And once we understand this, we realise that we are dealing with a philosophy that is far more robust than its trendy cultural avatar would allow us to believe. Behind the popular charge that existentialism tends to fetishise misery and loneliness lies a deeper truth about its account of the awkwardness of our inescapable human condition. When Sartre wrote Hell is Other People, he was not merely pointing to the modern condition with all its alienation and moral fragmentation. He was summarising the existentialist idea that, sense, that our sense of subjectivity, our sense of metaphysical freedom that emerges from the facts of our consciousness, is somehow compromised by the gaze of others. We are free as subjects, but when we become objects in the gaze of others, we no longer existential, eg exercise maximum freedom. Other people's perceptions can, become, can, can even come to tyrannise our sense of self. In the age of social media, this is a fascinating thing to consider. The promise of social media is that one can present oneself on one's own terms, that we can in some way take back control of our self-image in a way that we cannot in the workplace or on a date. However, in an attempt to externalise our subjectivity through selfies, long morose update posts, political rants, we in fact double down on becoming objects in other people's eyes. Even Sartre's cynicism about this constrictive dynamic could not have predicted the psychodrama of social media narcissism and self-objectification. Sartre's famous ideas of authenticity and bad faith, too, are frequently robbed of their nuance when filtered into the wider culture. To be authentic, then, means more for the existentialist than just being honest or sincere. In fact, honesty and sincerity themselves can, take, can be fake forms of authenticity. To be truly authentic is to maintain awareness of and constantly affirm one's free choice in every situation. To choose not to live as though we are free is to live in bad faith. The most famous example of bad faith, bad faith is the Nuremberg defence of just following orders. This is another way of saying, I had no choice. For Sartre, we always have a choice, and to claim that you didn't have a choice in a given situation, no matter how difficult, is to make yourself into an object rather than a subject. As Cox puts it, choosing not to choose is self-evasion. You're not just lying to yourself, you're denying the very truth of who you are. For such a short book, Cox's thesis packs a profound philosophical punch, and this is made all the more impactful through his ironic humour. For instance, he describes the rather difficult notion of Heidegger's Mitzien, which means something like collective subjectivity, as having a wee vibe. <laughs> as existentialists say Cox are like Mel Gibson in Braveheart, always banging on about freedom. And when he reassures us that it's okay to struggle with all these difficult philosophical terms and ideas, he says the brain is more like a stomach than, other pe than people like to think. Cox says that there is a widespread tendency among people to avoid confronting what life is really about, a desperate and sometimes quite violent effort to ignore the hard existential truths of the human condition. He also says that in our blame everyone but yourself culture, responsibility, nobility and dignity are often sacrificed in favour of convenient platitudes. Existentialism, however, offers us a way to live truthfully, with integrity, and to feel genuine hope even in the face of seemingly insurmountable challenges. That last line, actually, is really probably the key for me when you get down to it. But anyway, let, let me come back to that. 
the main thing I, I've discovered, and it's only recently since I did this adult education course in existentialism, that I realised that the, the, the technical, if you like, reasons why I like this philosophy, and rather than just knowing that I quite like Satra and I'd quite like to, to sit in bohemian cafes in a long coat and smoke cigarettes and drink coffee with hot girls... And he says some stuff that resonates. It just resonated with me. The human freedom of it, the the individuality of it, the the affirmation of creativity that's intrinsic in it as a source of value. So it's very romantic in that sense that in the repla- in the place of religion we put beauty. There's there's a lot of that in existentialism. But ultimately, it's that intrinsic value of the human being. All existentialists, from Kierkegaard, even through Nietzsche, right up to even Heidegger um, and Satra and Camus, right up to the late 60s, all of them are always affirming the intrinsic value and quality of the human person. It's not understood relative to other things, It's not understood as a utilitarian concept. It's intrinsically valuable, unfathomable, and, yeah, it's intrinsic, as opposed to extrinsic is basically the the fundamental truth of that. And that's what Sartre meant when he wrote or gave the speech Existentialism and Humanism. That's an interesting subject in itself, by the way, which I hope to write about. But um, let me see if I can find the. Let me read some fucking satra here. Just give me a second. It's a form of humanism because it it places the, the, it takes for granted certain aspects of the human being that are completely intrinsic. This is, I read my essay on Kierkegaard months ago, and that's basically Kierkegaard's message in, in Fear and Trembling. Just see. I think what it is basically is that the human being is in, I can't find the passage I want but the human being is intrinsically valuable it's 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 worth it for its own sake to preserve it it's the 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 intrinsic quality of the human person is the is itself a metaphysical claim as it says as I said in that that's important that what he says about human consciousness it's not just um, some nice idea of what human beings is. It's a, it's a rigorous account of Sartre's phenomenology of consciousness, i.e. strict, rigorous observations about the way the human minds interact with their environment and with each other. And from that, he's de- and that's why I say it's robust, he's deducing freedom. And in that is the... the Human, the human being is intrinsically valuable, and it's intrinsically valuable because it's from that very freedom that is intrinsic to it that emer- the other values emerge. They don't come from external rules. They don't come from nice ideas. They certainly don't come from political ideologies. He would try and square that with a kind of Marxist communitarianism later in his life, unsuccessfully in my view, as much as I know about it, which is not very much. I prefer the kind of more early libertarian individualist satra, obviously. But that doesn't mean I discount the the fact that there's that whole point about collective subjectivity, Heidegger's Metzian, that we can have a shared sense of our our, our collective freedom. That's an interesting concept. But... So that's the first thing that I like about it. And I think that was the first thing that probably grasped me is it's... it's, um, 
One doesn't need to be told one's good to be good. One doesn't need to be... We, it's, it's a philosophy that doesn't depend on external validation in any way, and that's liberating. And, I, and it comes from this. In, the, all of existentialists, however different they are, they all say that the human being is not reducible to anything. So they're very, so Sasha is very suspicious of Freud's reductionism and <clears throat> anything, and, and, and the romantics like Kierkegaard were very, suspe were very suspicious of scientism and hyper-rationalism and any kind of uh, maximizing, totalizing explanation like Hegel for the human condition, you know, that, that there's an essential mystery and beauty of the human being, which is part of what makes it valuable, is actually the source of its value. And anything that seeks to reduce and e explain away the human person will make it an object rather than a subject. And, and, and what makes human beings value it, it valuable is our subjectivity, not our objectivity. That's what makes us distinct from animals, but it's also what makes us not objects. And it's a crucial thing because it's, I believe that that now I now that I really see and try and understand it more in depth than I did when I was younger. That is an emancipation from any ideological trickery, whether it's a fucking public school or whether it's totalitarianism or whether it's groupthink on the light, right or left. All of these things are bad because they all make an object where there should be a subject, and this and and the nature of subjectivity is complex and subtle and ultimately unfathomable but it is all but but Sartre gets quite close in his account that it's freedom it's it, that, that that mystery lies in its freedom right also this the, the obviously the idea that would have attracted me when I was young and uh was the idea that you're the source of your own values which is the kind of Nietzschean aspect <clears throat> that um I mean, there's a there's 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 some Kierkegaard was there as well, and there's something Christian about it. You know, there's no point in just going through the rituals. It's the whole Pharisees, Christ and the Pharisees. You know, just by making yourself into a religious object who uh, commits all the the right acts doesn't make you godly. The godly choice is a is a is is a choice, essentially, and it's an active participation. It's in our actions that we prove ourselves to be godly. So there's something Christian in that. But it, but however you frame it in a Nietzschean or a Kierkegaardian or a Satrian way, essentially they all come down to this idea that we can become the source of our own values. The, um, but it's not enough. So it's... It un, it, what's great about that is that it recognizes that there's been, there, there, like Nietzsche said, there's there's been a collapse of values. But that we don't need to collapse into nihilism with that collapse. That the existentialists that differ from what became postmodernism or what becomes a kind of scientistic nihilism. They're both versions of the same thing. They w they differ from this because they say, "Okay, all that shit's gone now, but what? We'll, but at least, but we still have the human being. We still have human freedom, and isn't that fucking great? We still have art and beauty and human potential, despite war and misery and nastiness and all the things, and all the bad faith and all the the." the self-objectification that we, we, we continue to do, whether it's religion, ideology, nationalism, whatever, it, what all these excuses to turn ourselves into objects rather than subjects. Um, and all of, all the, the external bases for maintaining a moral order have collapsed and we must confront them. So there is a kind of recognition of a certain... Uh, well, the recognition of subjectivity can seem like a kind of postmodernist relativism, but it isn't because it says that there's some truth that we all share, which is that we're all free, we're all humans, we're all persons, we're all subjects, and and the and the and the intrinsic beauty and power and potential 
of subjectivity in itself is the, the basis for morality, and that's Sartre's point in, in, in his humanism lecture. But so it's it's non nihilistic recognition that we're purely dependent on subjectivity for our values. So it it, on, it goes down the same path that the the, the postmodernists want to go down, which is to to be a, a kind of brute recognition of the hard facts of our of of the un, of, of our awkward relationship with reality in a sense. But it but it but but the but they stop short because the, this idea of the human subject is a is a universal claim and and, and so it's an, it doesn't go down the path of nihilism we are and we we are free to create our own values but what unites us in a kind of universal value system is just that subjectivity <clears throat> and so on that topic i think that the 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 third piece of notes here i've got is that i think that it's a great antidote existentialism that's what this book really kicked home for me was it's a great antidote to postmodernist nihilism and and I've been looking into postmodernism recently and so I don't want to make any grand claims here uh, Jordan Peterson does make some hugely grand claims about the badness of postmodernism and he's and he's right on the, on the big picture but it seems to me from what I've been finding out just on fucking wikipedia searches and all that shit nothing major that there there's a, you could see a kind of postmodernism in the existentialism view because it's saying that there's no one there's no catholic church anymore right there's no grand universal you know the sort of nietzschean point that there's been a god is dead and there's a, that we need a reevaluation of all values etc cetera, etc cetera. and so there, there's there's a kind of postmodernism which says well we have to with the only uh, the only kind of way we can get through that is to live with a kind of ironic understanding that we'll never know the truth so there's a kind of ironic agnosticism about the way we relate to the world and that's fine right but there's a later version of postmodernism which becomes ideological and political and that's where Jordan Peterson's critique is entirely right and it's all about it takes the Foucauldian idea that if we understand the structures of power we understand we understand our own kind of mental slavery or whatever it is and takes that to the hilt and just creates a whole kind of grand ideology ironically um and so the the the, the there there's a sense that uh, existentialism could be compatible and and indeed i think Sartre and Foucault are friends but I, so i think that there's there's a, there, there is a sort of relationship there but the, but it's but what but post the late the sort of extreme version of postmodernism we're now dealing with, which is nihilistic, highly ideological. That's ironic in itself, but it's true. It's not false to say it's both ideological and nihilistic because it's ideological. It's ideologically opposed to any grand narrative. So they hate those types hate existentialism, as far as I can gather, or they they re, and they, they hate the romanticism of it. Because that romanticization of the human person, they claim, can only be a product of white, middle class, bourgeois, French, Western European ideas of humanity. I'm going to make a grand claim here. That's horseshit. That's horseshit. Because he's not, he's make to say that we are all free to me you know that we we are all condemned to be free which is the grand narrative that Sartre says that we are condemned to contingency and we are condemned because of that contingency to freedom and so therefore it's our subjectivity and our freedom that is the foundation of values and he falls back on a kind of Kantian universalism so it's what what's good is what we can uh, say is fundamental to all human beings given our knowledge of that fact of freedom that is not something that i can't i don't think you can name one reason why that would be any less true for a woman in iran or a man in new york or a, or a um someone working in mcdonald's in 
Ohio or someone working in a field in Afghanistan. There just isn't anything you can tell me there that would make that make the claim that they're they are free any less the case. Now you can you can have quibbles with Sartre's account of freedom or even the existentialist account of freedom, but you cannot relativize the critique. You can't say it's more true for someone in New York than it is for someone in Afghanistan. If you're doing that, then you this is where postmodernism, the, the sort of the sort of brand that we're fighting against here, the nihilistic brand, really gets into its problems. <clears throat> anyway, I think I'm going to leave it there. I, w I was going to talk about all this rhetoric stuff, which is really, I mean, all this Brexit stuff has been really depressing me. All this claims about, you know, surrender being terrible rhetoric and blah, 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 blah. It just reminds me of the, the all these moralizing lefties who use compassion and, and, and the language of compassion as a kind of weapon to beat their enemies. They remind me of the 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 structure of power <laughs> at, at my public school. That's what they remind me of because it's all this high-minded ideals used as a weapon to beat down individual expression. And the irony of it is, is this is double. It leads to a double standard when it becomes a relativized weapon of political games, because. And I put this on my Instagram. There's that. There's a book that was released called My Little Book of. What was it? That Brexiteers I want to stab. So basically, there's a double standard and a hypocrisy about all these people moralizing about rhetoric, right? And um, I'm getting sick of it and sick and tired of it. And I, I. It, it just confirms to me that the most dangerous people are the people who are using the language of compassion, not the meta military metaphors like surrender act or anything that um, Boris Johnson has said. I like Boris. There, I said it. I like Boris. I voted leave. I think that one of the reasons is, is that I voted leave was that is an existentialist reason that the the Davos man corporate vision of the European Union has at its root a very limited and degraded view of the human being, which is a sort of corporate social democrat drone rather than a disheveled, freewheeling, instinctive, intuitive, romantic individual, which is what I'm all about. So I find more of a foundation for that kind of view of human nature that I value in the million British liberal tradition than I do in anything in the very corporate neoliberal uh, blandified view of human nature that I find in, in in the European Union. So it's it's philosophical reasons. That's the one. The other one I've talked about, which you can't have the foundation of a state based on trade deals. At no point in history have we simply just constructed a state on a trade deal. And any attempt to to just to 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 keep to construct a state on purely corporate grounds has been imperialistic and has always had to turn into something else, like the Dutch East India Company and all that. Those are extreme examples. I'm not saying the EU is like that. But every time you try to do that, you've had to find other foundations for it. Um, so I think that we rely much more on tradition and heritage for freedom than we like to admit. And that's, so there you go. Anyway, I mean, anyone that fucking listens to me or whatever knows that already. But I just, <clears throat> all this rhetoric crap that's been said this week is purely hypocritical. 
It's purely ideological and partisan. It's got nothing to do with actually dialing down the rhetoric. And actually, it's like what I said, the Dylan line, sometimes Satan comes as a man of peace. Sometimes Satan comes as a man of peace. Thank you.